Hi everyone, this is Dr. Nock. Today we're going to learn about applications of linear equations and modeling. For the prep for this section, please review adding and subtracting fractions. And don't hate. I'm here to help you, so feel free to reach out to me if you forgot how to do so or if you need extra practice with me. In this section, we're going to learn how to apply the point slope formula, and that's an equation of a line as well, and determine the slopes of parallel and perpendicular lines, create linear functions and model data, and create models using linear regression. So for this section, I will also go over um, how to do the linear regression by using TI-83 or TI-84. Let's briefly go over what we're about to learn. So first topic is writing an equation of a line in point-slope formula. It says the point-slope formula for a line is given by y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, where m is the slope of the line and x1 and y1 is a point on the line. Don't worry, we, we're about to do some examples involving this. And next, we're going to learn about slopes of parallel and perpendicular lines. So parallel lines, right? Two lines are parallel, then their slope must be the same. Now two lines are perpendicular to each other, then the first slope, or it, it doesn't matter the first or the second slope, either way, it must be the negative reciprocal of the other. Or equivalently, the first slope times the second slope must equal to negative one. Right after we're comfortable doing that, then we'll start on the, some applications of uh, involving linear functions. So the first one will be linear cost function, and then linear revenue function, and then linear profit function. And saving the fun for last, we're going to be learning about creating a linear regression model. Now, when we go over this section, first we'll do it by hand, and then I will show you how to use your TI-83 and TI-84. Anyways, let's get started. Our first topic is point-slope formula. So let's see what it is. It says the point-slope formula for a line is given by y minus y1 equals m times the quantity x minus x1, where m is the slope and x1, y1 is any point on the line. And this x right here and then this variable y here, they stay as just x and a y. So only thing that uh, you're going to plug them in are the slope and x1 and then y1. This is just another formula to write an equation of a line. Now, in previous section, we learned about the slope-intercept formula, which is defined by y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope and then b is the y-intercept. Please know both formulas and corresponding names for each of the formula. Alrighty, so let's start doing some examples. Example 1 it says, use the point-slope formula to write an equation of the line having the given conditions. Then, write the equation in slope-intercept form. So one thing I totally forgot to mention is this, sorry. Um, given a point-slope formula, you can always derive the, the other formula, which is the slope-intercept form, as you will see in a minute. So the first example is, write the equation of a line in both formulas, which passes through a point, negative 4, 1, and it has a slope of 4 fifth. So first, let's start out with the point-slope formula. All right, point-slope formula, it says y minus y1 equals to m x minus x1. All right, so here we already know the slope is 4 fifth, and then here we're given a point so it's going to be negative 4, 1. So your x1 is going to be your negative 4. And then y1 is going to be the 1. So all you got to do is just plug and jug. So let's go. So you're going to have y minus y1, which is 1, equals 4 fifth. 
and then x minus x1, so you're going to have another minus 4. Let's clean up a little bit. So therefore, the point slope form is going to be y minus 1 equals 4 fifth, and then x plus 4. As you see in a minute, to get from point slope to slope intercept, all you have to do is just solve for y from the point slope formula. But anyways, let's do it. So the uh, point slope is done, so the slope intercept. Now the formula was y equals mx plus b. So by using the point slope form, we're going to solve for y. So ready? So this is going to be y minus 1 equals, now I'm going to distribute the 4 fifth to each term here. So then here we're going to get 4 fifth x plus, let me do this step by step, 4 over 5 times 4. But 4 times 4 is the same thing as 4 over 1, isn't it? Okay, so then let's just work this very slowly. So you're going to have a y minus 1 equals 4 over 5x and then plus. Now you're going to multiply uh, 4 fifth times four, uh, just the 4. So you're going to have 16 over 5. All right, now we're going to add 1 to both sides. So then we're going to get y equals 4 over 5x plus 16 over 5 plus 1. But since we need to add the two fractions together, what we need to do is we have to get the common denominator. But you know what? Let me just write it as 1 for now. Okay, so now what we're going to do is this. Let's work this as a side work. Just in case you forgot how to add the two fractions together. So let's go. So 16 over 5. So sorry, I forgot the right side work. Okay, so we got 16 over 5 plus 1 is same thing as 16 over 5. Now the common denominator needs to be 5. So which means that I better have a 5 on top because 5 over 5 becomes 1. So now we can add the numerators together. Then what are we going to get? 21 over 5. Looks good to me. So now let's just rewrite. So therefore, the slope-intercept form is going to be y equals 4 over 5x and then plus 21 over 5. Let's take a look at the next problem. It says, find the equation of a line in point slope and slope-intercept form, which passes through two points, which are negative 4, 1 and negative 7, negative 3. So let's first write down the point slope. So the formula was y minus y1 equals m and then x minus x1. Now, unlike the previous problem, we don't have the slope here. But since we're given two points, we should be able to compute the slope. So let's first do that. So we need to get ourselves a slope which is y2 minus y1, whole thing divided by x2 minus x1. Now, again, it doesn't matter which one you want to call it to be x1 or y1, but let's just make this into a x1, y1, and then x2, y2. All right, so then if I go in that order, then you're going to have negative 3 and then minus 1 all over negative 7 minus and then another minus 4, so the numerator is negative 4, and denominator becomes negative 7 plus 4, which gives us negative 4 over negative 3. Don't leave it like that. Negative over a negative becomes a positive. So our slope is going to be 4 thirds. So now we got ourselves an M. Now, what about x1 and y1? So here I call this one x1 and y1, but you can easily call this one x1 and y1 as well. So my point is that if you're given two points, it doesn't matter which point that you're going to plug it in. However, it will look different in point slope form. But if you make that into a slope intercept form, you will see that they are identical. So let me just show you um, both ways then. Okay, so suppose that I'm going to choose our x1 and then y1 to be negative 4, 1. Then 
what we're going to get is y minus y1. So y minus 1 equals m, which is 4 thirds, times x minus uh, x1, so which is going to be another negative 4. So here you're going to have y minus 1 equals 4 thirds, and then x plus 4. So that will be the point slope if I chose the first ordered pair. Now let me choose the second ordered pair. So suppose I chose uh, my x1 and y1 to be negative 7 comma negative 3. Let's see what's going to happen. So this implies that we're going to get y minus minus 3 equals m, which is 4 thirds. And then here you're going to have a x minus minus 7. Clean it up. Then we're going to get y plus 3 equals 4 thirds and then x plus 7. So look at it. They look totally different, right? But now let's see what's going to happen if we make each one of them into a slope intercept form. So let's work on the first equation. So slope intercept. The formula is y equals mx plus b. So basically, again, we're solving for y. Okay, so then let's do that step by step. So here you're going to have y minus 1 equals, now I'm going to distribute 4 thirds to x in a 4 to get 4 thirds x plus 4 thirds times another 4. So then you're going to have y minus 1 equals 4 over 3x. And then plus 4, same thing as 4 over 1. So here you're going to get 16 over 3. So then y equals 4 thirds x. And then you got plus 16 over 3. Now I need to add 1 to both sides, correct? So I got to go plus 1 plus 1. So here we're going to have plus 1. Now if you're not comfortable right away, then just work step by step, you know? Just work this as a side work. Okay, so if you have 16 over 3 plus 1, what's the common denominator? That's 3, isn't it? So here we're going to get 16 over 3 plus 3 over 3, which is going to give us 19 over 3. Okay, so therefore, our equation in sloped intercept form is going to be y equals m, which is 4 thirds x, and then plus 19 over 3. Now let's take a look at the second equation. So let's do the same thing. So here I'm just going to write it as slope intercept, slope int. Again, it's y equals mx plus b. So we're going to solve for y. So we got y plus 3 equals 4 thirds x, and then plus 4 thirds times 7. So then we get y plus 3 equals 4 thirds x and plus 7 is same thing as 7, or 7 over 1 which is 28 over 3. Now we're going to add, oh not to add sorry, subtract 3 from both sides this time. So then we're going to get y equals 4 thirds x and then we got plus 28 over 3 and then minus 3. So again, let's just take one step at a time and let's just work this as a side work. So we have 28 over 3 minus 3, which is, that's a 3 there, sorry. And then so you're going to have a 28 over 3 minus, now you're going you're gonna to have to write 3 as a fraction with the denominator of 3. So remember, 3 is the same thing as 3 over 1, isn't it? So then in order for me to get 3 here, that means I need to multiply the bottom by 3. That means I better be fair and multiply the top by 3. Make sense? So here, what I need to do is multiply the top and bottom by 3 over 3 so that we can get a 3 on the denominator. All right, so then here we're going to have 3. And 3 times 3 is 9. So then 
combining that, so we got a 28 minus 9, that's 19 over 3. So now do you see what's going to happen? So therefore, our second equation in sloped intercept form is going to be y equals 4 thirds x and then plus 19 over 3, which is exactly the same thing as what we got from the first equation. So again, it does not matter which ordered pair that you're going to take to write, your, uh, write the point slope form. Okay, now let's take a look at something different. Write the equation of a line that passes through negative 4 over 7, comma, 3 over 10, and slope is undefined. So here comes what we learned in the last section. Do you remember what kind of line that we're going to get if the slope is undefined? Yes, you're going to get a vertical line. If it's a horizontal line, remember, the slope is zero, but if it's vertical, your slope is undefined. So let me write that. So slope being undefined means that we're going to have a vertical line. And the equation for the vertical line is always going to be x equals some kind of a x value. So let me just write it as constant. And then if it's horizontal, then you're going to have to write an equation y equals the y value. So here, since we're talking about the vertical line, x equals constant, so all we have to do is just pick negative 4 over 7, and then to write, just write x equals negative 4 over 7. Now remember, this is an equation of a line, not a point on the number line. So here would be the little rough sketch of it. So please note that x equals negative 4 over 7. We're talking about the equation of a line, not just a point on the number line. Our next topic is slopes of parallel and perpendicular lines. So let's just read this. So number one, if m1 and m2 represent the two slopes of two non-vertical parallel lines, then their slope must be the same. M1 must equal to M2. And number two, if M1 and M2 represent the two slopes of two non-vertical perpendicular lines, perpendicular means they intersect in 90 degree angle, then the slope, their slope must be negative reciprocal of the other. So here M1 better equal to negative 1 over M2 or when you multiply the two slopes together, it's going to multiply two negative one, their equivalent. So in case you're not familiar with what the parallel lines are, so I just kind of like drew the picture here. Two lines are parallel. That means that those two lines will be never crosses each other. And the perpendicular lines, I know this doesn't look like 90 degrees, but it's just intersect in 90 degree angle. Let's do example two. It says determine if the lines defined by the given equations are parallel, perpendicular, or neither. So the first example that we're given is first equation is 2x plus 3y equals 7. And the second equation is 4x equals negative 6y plus 2. To determine whether the lines are parallel or perpendicular, it all depends on the slope, right? So the easiest way to go about it is make both equations into slope-intercept form, which is y equals mx plus b, so that way you can tell what the slope for the each line is going to be. So let's first take the first equation, so which is this guy here. So basically, we're about to solve for y. That's all. Okay, so then if I subtract 2x from both sides, then you're going to have 3y equals negative 2x and then plus 7. And dividing by 3, so let's just call that m1, the first slope. And we're going to do the same thing for the second equation here. So then here, let's see, who should I move? How about we subtract 2 from both sides? Because we're trying to solve for y, right? So then let me just flip the equations around. So this is the same thing as negative 6y. It's going to equal to 4x minus 2. Now we're going to divide everybody by negative 6. And what do we get here? 
So we're gonna get y equals negative, uh, what is that, two thirds x, and then minus one over three. So our second slope is exactly the same thing as the first slope. So what is our conclusion? Yes, two lines are parallel. Let's look at the next one. Feel free to pause the video and try this on your own if you like. But I'm going to go over it. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing. So let me just solve for y from the first equation. So this wasn't too bad. So all you have to do is divide it by 5 on both sides, no? So you got to go divide it by 5, divide it by 5. So then what we're going to get is y equals 2 over 5x. So our slope is 2 fifths. So let me just call that m1. And then, oh, look at that. This isn't bad either. So second one to solve for y, I'll just add y to both sides. And then what are we going to get? We're going to get y equals 5 over 2x. So here, our slope is 5 over 2. So what do you think? First of all, this is not parallel because slopes are different, right? And if it's perpendicular, they must be negative reciprocal of each other. Or if you multiply m1 times m2, it must multiply to negative 1 in order to be perpendicular. All right, but here, if I multiply m1 and m2, we're going to get a positive 1, which does not equal to negative 1. So here, this will be neither. This is neither parallel nor perpendicular. Okay, what I want you to do is try this on your own. All right, so please pause the video and go for it. I'm going to assume that you try this, so let's go. So first of all, there's nothing to do for the first equation. M1 is given to us. And for the second one, yeah, you can add 5 to both sides if you really want to solve for um, slope-intercept form. But let's just do it that way since we've been doing this already. So we here we're going to have y equals negative 3 over 4x and then plus 5. So here, our second slope is negative 3 fourth. So I believe that this is going to be perpendicular because they are negative reciprocal of each other. Or you can just check to see m1 times m2. You're going to have 4 thirds multiplying here by negative 3 fourth which is going to multiply to negative 1. So in this case, two lines are perpendicular. Let's take a look at example 3. It says, write an equation of the line satisfying the given conditions. Write the answer in slope-intercept form and standard form. So first, let's review what was the slope-intercept form. So slope-intercept form is going to look like y equals mx plus b. And the standard form, it looks like this. ax plus by equals to c. Let's look at the first example. Passing through a point 3 comma negative 1 and this line must be parallel to the line negative 3x plus y equals 4. Now remember that two lines are parallel to each other if their slopes are the same, right? So first what we need to do is we need to find the slope of this equation and then we're going to take that same slope to write an equation of a line that's passing through 3 comma negative 1. But anyways, let's get started. So step number 1, what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for y. So that way I can make this equation into y equals mx plus b, which is the slope-intercept form. So let me do that. So this isn't too bad. So all I got to do is just add 3x to both sides. Then we're going to get y equals 3x and then plus 4. So the slope of the given line is 3. Now we want to write an equation of a line that is parallel to it. Which means that the line must have slope of 3. 
So let me just box that because we need it. Now the problem boils down to this. We want to write an equation of a line with slope 3 passing through 3 comma negative 1. From here, there are a couple ways that we can do this. So if you just want to start out with the slope intercept form, right, then all you have to do is find the y intercept using the fact that this line is passing through 3 comma negative 1, which means that 3 comma negative 1 must satisfy the equation. So if I use that method, then here we're going to have 3, I mean not 3, sorry, y equals 3x and then plus b. But the thing is, 3 comma negative 1 is on the line, right, so which means that it must satisfy the equation. So here, when x is 3, y is negative 1, then here our y is negative 1 equals 3 times our x is 3 and then plus b, which means that we're going to get negative 1 equals 9 plus b, and then subtracting 9 to both sides, then let me just change up the color, minus 9 minus 9, then our y-intercept b is going to be negative 10. So here's one way to do it. Uh, don't stop here, just make sure to write the equation of a line. So therefore, equation of the line in slope-intercept form is going to be y equals 3x and then minus 10. So here's one way to do it. So let's just call that a method one. Now let's look at method two. Method two is to start out with the point slope formula. So here, remember the uh, point slope? It looks like y minus y1 equals m and then x minus x1. So here our x1 is given to us and then y1 is given to us. So which means that we have y minus y1 is negative 1 equals, now slope is 3, and then here you're going to have x minus x1. So x1 is going to be 3. So then just clean up a little bit. Then this implies that we have y plus 1 equals, now I'm going to distribute the 3 in to get 3x and then minus 9. And then solving for a y, then we need to subtract 1 from both sides. Then here, we're still going to get y equals 3x and then minus 10. I usually use method 2, but, you know, choose your favorite weapon. So those are the slope-intercept form. Now let's go with the standard form. So the standard form should look like ax plus by equals to c. So all you have to do is bring all the x and y on the left-hand side of it and set the right-hand side equal to a constant. So here, just uh, use the slope-intercept form. So we just got a slope-intercept form as y equals 3x minus 10, right? And then just bring the 3x on the left-hand side by subtracting 3x. That's all you got to do. So here, then, what are we going to get? Negative 3x and then plus y equals negative 10. So this is in standard form. And please note that the graph of y equals 3x minus 10 and the graph of 3x plus y equals negative 10 are exactly the same line. Okay, I'm so sorry. This graph looks really, really tiny. I just had to squeeze it in somewhere. So here, this was our given line. So this line was given by negative 3x plus y equals to 4. And what we just did was we wrote an equation of a line that is going to pass through 3 comma negative 1 and also parallel to the given line. So this blue line right here is our y equals 3x minus 10. Let's take a look at this example. So we want to write an equation of a line that passes through a point 5 comma 3 and is perpendicular to the line x minus 2y equals 7. Okay, so first let's determine the slope of the given line. So again, what we're going to do is given x minus 2y equals 7, we're going to solve for y so that we can determine what the slope of the, uh, of the equation is. So let me just... Um, subtract x from both sides. 
then we're going to get negative 2y equals negative x plus 7. Now dividing by negative 2, then what we're going to get is y equals, now negative x over negative 2, do you see that that's, if that's going to be x over 2? But do you see that x over 2 is the same thing as 1 half x? All right, and then here you're going to have a minus 7 over 2. Okay, so if you kind of got lost right there, take a look. So note, so if I have a, let, let's just go x over 2. I claim that this is same thing as 1 half times x because do you see that x is same thing as x over 1, isn't it? And how do you multiply the two fractions together? Yes, you just multiply it across. So if I multiply this, you're going to have a 1 times x, which is x, 2 times 1, which is 2. Anyway, so here is the slope of the given line. All right, so now what we want to do is we want to write a perpendicular. line which means that your slope must be negative reciprocal of the other so here if i take the negative reciprocal so first of all it's negative and then reciprocal means you uh, flip the uh, numerator and denominator so here you're going to have 2 over 1 which is just going to be negative 2. So the question boils down to write the equation of a line with slope negative 2 and passing through 5 comma 3. So what I like to do is I just want to use method 2 if that's okay with you. So I'm going to first bust out the point slope form. Which is y minus y1 equals m and then x minus x1. So here, our m is negative 2, and x1 is 5, and then uh, y1 is 3. So let's just plug and chug. So then here, what we're going to get is y minus 3 equals negative 2, and then x minus 5. Now from here, all you got to do is just solve for y to get the slope-intercept form. So here, let me just um, first distribute the negative 2 to each term. Then here we're going to get y minus 3 equals negative 2x and then plus 10. And then what we're going to do is just add 3 to both sides, plus 3 and then plus 3. So then we're going to get y equals negative 2x and then plus 13. So this is in slope-intercept form. And from here, make this into a standard form. Just move the negative 2x on the left-hand side by adding it. So here, if I have to show all of my work, I'm going to go plus 2x plus 2x. So here, what we're going to get is 2x plus y equals 13. So now this is in standard form. Okay, so here is the graph of what we just did here. So the green line, which is this line right here, was our given line, which is x minus 2y equals 7. And this purple line here, notice that it's intersecting in 90 degree angle. So that equation is y equals negative 2x plus 13. All right, next, let's take a look at a problem like this. Uh, write an equation of a line which passes through the point negative 7 over 9 comma 7 over 3 and is perpendicular to the x-axis. So I want you to think about this a little bit. Um, so please pause the video and try to figure it out what the heck is going on and try to solve the problem here. All right, I'm going to think that you tried this already. So first, let's just sketch it out and see what's going on here now where is negative 7 over 9 okay so let's just pretend that this is x equals negative 7 over 9 and then y is 7 over 3 so let me, let's just pretend that here is going to be 7 over 3 let's just say so it's this point is the ordered pair that's what uh, what we're given now your line has to pass through this. I don't know if it's going this way or this way. Now, let's read the next sentence. Perpendicular to the x-axis. 
So do you see that no matter what, what we need to do is from this point, I need to draw a straight line that's going to intersect the x-axis in 90 degrees. So what is that equation of that line? Yes, that's nothing but x equals negative 7 over 9. Now, again, that is an equation of a line, not a point. So we're done. That is going to be our answer. Our next topic is to create linear function to model data. So this portion is going to be all applications. Now, we're going to take a look at three different types of applications. The first one is to use linear function in application. Second one, we're going to learn about the linear cost, revenue, and profit functions. And lastly, we're going to create linear regression model. For the first two, yes, these are going to be word problems. Don't hate. It is not as bad as you think. All right. And but then I feel you, though, because, you know, when I was a student, I believe it or not, I actually took the same class. I hated word problems, you know, so on the test, I just skipped it. So please do not be like me. All right. Do not skip the word problems. We're going to embrace it. Anyways, let's get started. So here's example three. By the way, can you see this okay? Um, I try to blow it up as much as I can, but um, I will read it. Okay, so it says example three, it says a speeding ticket is $100 plus $5 for every one miles per hour over the speed limit. So the part A, it says write a linear function to model the cost S of X in dollars of a speeding ticket for a person caught driving x miles per hour over the speed limit. So here, we're going to denote the cost. We're going to form a function here. So we're going to call it, let's just call it S of x. So first of all, right, no matter what, you're going to get charged $100, right? So no matter what, we have to pay $100. And then $5 for every one mile per hour over the speed limit. So if you are over one mile per hour, right, then you're going to have to add in five bucks. Now, what if you are two miles per hour over the speed limit? Isn't it two times five or five times two? Five dollars times two, so I have to pay ten dollars. So what if if I go six miles per hour over the speed limit? Isn't it five dollars times by six? So here, we're denoting x as a miles per hour over the speed limit. So that our equation is going to be 100 plus 5x. So therefore, our s of x, let's put the variable term first so that it looks like y equals mx plus b, slope intercept form. So here, we're going to have 5x plus 100. Now, part B says, evaluate S of 15 and interpret the meaning in the context of this problem. So let's first compute S of 15. So S of 15 is going to be 5 times 15 and then plus 100. All right, so what is that? What's 5 times 15? Is that 75? and then plus 100. So that is going to be 175. Now, what does this mean? Think about it a little bit. So I, I think this means that a ticket costs $175 for a person caught speeding 15 miles per hour over the speed limit. Because our x, remember, x denotes the miles per hour uh, miles per hour over the speed limit, and here our x is 15. So that means that x miles per hour over the speed limit, so 15 miles per hour over the speed limit. So let me write that out. Dang, that's a lot of money. $175 for speeding 50 miles per hour over the speed limit? Sucks for the person who got the ticket, but 
Anyways, let's just move on, shall we? So let's look at example four. And this has nothing to do with the speeding ticket. But before we go over this, we need to go over what is a linear cost function looks like and what is the linear revenue function looks like and what is the linear profit function is going to look like. So let's talk about that, then come back to example four. Okay, so linear cost revenue and profit functions. So let's first go with what is a linear cost function is going to look like. It says a linear cost function models the cost C of X to produce X items, which is denoted by C of X equals MX plus B, where M is the variable cost per item and B is the fixed cost. And the fixed cost does not change relative to the number of items produced. For example, the cost to rent an office is a fixed cost. The variable cost per item is the rate at which cost increases for each additional unit produced. Variable costs include labor, material, and shipping. And a linear revenue function models the revenue, R of X, for selling X items. So R of X is denoted by P times X. Now the product P times X represent the price per item P. So P stands for the price per item times or multiply by the number of items sold, which is denoted by X. And the linear profit function models the profit for producing and selling X items. And the profit function is defined by P of X, which is going to be the revenue function minus the cost function. So that's why it says subtract the, what the heck, cost to produce X items? What was I trying to uh, type here? Oh, cost function. That should be a cost to produce X items from the revenue brought in from selling X items. My apologies. So this word should have been cost. All right, I think we're ready to do example four. So in case you cannot read it, let me just read it. It says a small business makes cookie and sells them at the farmer's market. The fixed monthly cost for use of a health department approved kitchen and rental space at the farmer's market is $790. The cost of labor, taxes, and ingredients for the cookie amounts to 24 cents per cookie and the cookies sell for six dollars per dozen i know just reading this i was already like oh my gosh what is going on there's so much information but you know what we're gonna do this together all right so let's go so part a it says write a linear cost function representing the cost c of x to produce x dozen cookies per month now let's recall the cost function. It's denoted by C of X equals MX plus B, where M is the variable cost and B is the fixed cost. Now, what's the difference between the variable cost and fixed cost? A variable cost change based on the amount of output produced and variable costs may include labor uh, and you know some materials, labor, taxes, and ingredients in this case. And for the fixed cost, remain the same regardless of production output. So the fixed cost may include like lease and like rental payments. So in this case, uh, rental payment is $790, no? So we already got the value of B. So now what we need to do is we need to determine M, which is the variable cost. Now let's reread this question again. So here not the whole thing. It says the cost of labor, taxes, and ingredients for the cookie. So isn't that nothing but the variable cost, right? How much is it? 24 cents per cookie. And the cookies sell for $6 per dozen. Now be careful right here because we're given the amount of per cookie, right? And here is $6 per dozen. So this is by dozen. So how many cookies are in a dozen? 12. So here, our variable cost is going to be
24 cents per cookie, but we're going to be producing 12 cookies. So we're going to have to multiply that by 12, which gives us 2.88. All right, so that plays the role of our M. So let me just write that as M. And let me box that because I need this piece of information. Okay, so now I think we can write the cost function. So therefore, cost function, which is C of X, equals MX plus B. So our M is 2.88 times X. And then plus the fixed cost, which is going to be $790. So here is our answer. Now let's look at part B. It says, write a revenue function representing the revenue R of X for selling X dozen cookies here. Now we got the dozen cookies going on. So let me first write the revenue function. So the revenue function R of X equals p times x where p is the price per item but remember our item is a dozen of cookies now all right and then x is the number of items sold so in this case our item is the dozen and then number of items sold is denoted by x so what is the revenue functions going to be so r of x better equal to selling X dozen cookies, right? So do you see that we should be able to write this as R of X equals six, which is $6 per dozen, and then number of items sold is denoted by X, so it should just be R of X equals six X. And part C, it asks for write a profit function representing the profit for producing and selling X dozen cookies in a month. Let's recall that the profit function is revenue minus the cost. So here, if I denote the profit function by P of X, then revenue was denoted by R of X, and then cost function was denoted by C of X. So let's plug those in. So therefore, we're going to get P of X equals R of X was we just computed it, which is 6X minus, and then the cost function was, what was it? Was it 2.88X and then plus 790? And let's simplify that to get, well, I'm just going to distribute the minus sign to each term here. So... What do we get here? So let me just um, change up the color. So this is going to be 6x minus 2.88x and then minus 790. So what's 6 minus 2.88? Oh, my brain hurts right now. What is that? 3.12? So this is 3.12x and then minus 790. So therefore, our profit function, P of x, equals 3.12x minus 790. How are you all doing? Are you doing okay up to here? Let me know if you have any questions. And uh, the next question asks is this, determine the number of cookies, sorry, determine the number of cookies in dozens that must be produced and sold for a monthly profit. So here, do you see that what we want is for the profit to be positive? Right, so basically what we want is our profit needs to be greater or equal to zero. So, all right, now profit function was defined by P of X, right? So let's just follow that through. So here, what we want is our P of X, which was given by 3.12X minus 790 from the the example that we just did, and we want that to be greater or equal to zero. And what we're going to do here is we're going to solve for X because X denotes the number of dozens of cookies that's being sold. All right, so let's go. So now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add 790 to both sides. Then what we're going to get is 3.12x 
better be greater or equal to 790. Now, dividing by 3.12. Oh no, my brain hurts already. I have to do this. What is that? <sighs> my calculator is downstairs. I don't want to go grab it. <sighs> okay, let me just do it as a side work and then um, let me just write the answer down. All right, let's do this. So we got 790 divided by 3.12. Remember what to do? First, you got to move the decimal places to make it into a whole number, which is 312. So how many decimal places did I have to move? Tw two, right? So then I'm going to have to add in the two zeros, and then here comes the decimal happening. Okay, then you're going to have to ask yourself, how many times is 312 is going to go in 790? So I think that's twice. Okay, then you go 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times 1 is 2, 2 times 3 is 6. Now you subtract 790 minus 624. So that's going to be 6 and then 6 and then 1. Then you drop this 0 down. Now you're going to have to ask yourself, how many times is 312 going to go into 1660? So maybe five. If it goes over or under, we'll just change it up. Okay. So um, furthermore, I, I multiply in Japanese, especially when I'm tired. So it, is it okay if I do that? Okay, let me just do it real quick. Konnichiwa, and then gochiwa, gorokuu, and then gosanjiwa. There you go. All right. So then you do the same thing. You subtract. So then here you're going to have a zero, zero, one. Then you drop this zero down. All right. Then you repeat. How many times? is 312 is going to go into 1000 maybe three times then you go sorry again it's in japanese i'm tired okay so then here if i subtract this you're going to have a four and then here six is that right does that look right to you yeah, I think that's okay. And then here comes the decimal. That means that you're going to have to add on one other zero. And then you drop this zero down. Can you see that? Now you have 640. Uh, and now you have to ask yourself, how many times is 312 going to go into 640? So that's twice, isn't it? So here, what's 2 times three, uh, 312? subtract and then here you're going to have 16 then you will drop down add in another zero and drop down another zero but let's not do that that's good enough all right so here what we just discovered is that our x is going to be greater or equal to approximately 253.2 but since we're selling that uh, by the dozen if i have just 300 i'm sorry not 300 253 doesn't then we're not going to make any profit because of that point two so let's just round it up make that into a whole number and then just make it into 254 so here let me just in order to make the profit so i'm going to go x better be greater or equal to 254 all right so let me box that now i'm completely run out of room here so i'm going to do part e on the next page so let me just write down the um the answer here let me just erase this for a second okay so here our answer is going to be business um, how do I word this will make a profit a profit if it produces 254 dozens or more. All right, and that's going to be our answer. Now I think about it, maybe I should just go downstairs. That would have been quicker. My apologies, y'all. Okay, so let me copy and paste um, part E. All right, part E says, if 150 dozen cookies are sold in a given month, how much money will the business make or lose? Now here, since we're wondering about the profit, right? 
So how much money will the business make or lose as a profit? So first, this has to do with the profit function. So let me write down the profit function that we got from part D. So our profit function is P of X equals 3.12X and that was minus 790. Now, since X denotes the number of dozen cookies, right? What do you think we should do here? Because look at the question again. It says if 150 dozen cookies are sold, then are we going to lose money or are we going to make some profit, right? So here, what we should do is replace our X with 150. Now, if we get a positive result, then we make profit. And if we get a negative number, we're going to lose that money. So let's check. So P of 150 oh, is going to be 3.12 times 150 and then minus 790. So which is going to give us 468 minus 790. And what is going to give us, oh, my brain's so fried right now. What is that? Minus 322. Please double check my work, though. Minus 322. So what does that mean? Yeah, the business will lose uh, $322. So let me just write that out. And that was that. All right, our next topic is creating a linear regression model. I think this part is really, really cool. But anyways, let me just write down what we're about to do. Given a set of data points, let's just call them x, y, y, 1, comma, x, 2, y, 2, comma, dot, 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 x, n, y, n. What we want is the line that minimizes the sum of the squared vertical derivation from the observed data points to the line. If that was a complete gibberish, let me just draw the picture so you understand what we're about to do. Okay, so pretend that these are the data points. Let's just call this like maybe x1, y1, x2, y2, and so forth. Now, what we want to have is a line that best fits them like this. So here, what I did was I just eyeballed it and then drew the straight line as close as possible to all points and a similar number of points above and below this line. And this line right here is called the least squares regression line. Now again, notice that this is a straight line, right? So we should be able to model this as y equals mx plus b. Now if, wanna, if you want to digest this, y, you can view it as how far up the graph is going to go. x, it would be the how far along the graph is going to go. m, is yes, it's a slope, but what slope? How steep the line is. And B is the y-intercept, but is not where the line crosses the y-axis. So think of it in that way. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to use the graphing calculator to come up with the, the line of best fit, which is same thing as least squares regression line. So let's go over the procedure, to, um, how to create a linear regression model. So step one, graph the data points in a scatter plot. Number two, step two, inspect the data visually to determine if the data suggests a linear trend. And step three, invoke the linear regression future on a calculator, graphing utility or spreadsheet. Let's not go through the spreadsheet. Let's just go with the graphing utility. And step four, Check the result by graphing the line with the data points to verify that the line passes through or near the data points. So please go get your graphing calculator and let's do it. Okay, so here's example five. The table gives the number of calories and the amount of cholesterol for selected fast food hamburgers. So here are the data points that were given. So pretend that this is your X values. And then the cholesterol is going to be your corresponding y value. So here is what I like to do. Um, I would like to make a separate video and attach that video, calculator use of the video with this lecture. But here, let me just write down 
what are the steps are like what the keystrokes is going to be so that you can come up with the the line of best fit or linear regression line all right so here is what you need to do if you have a ti 83 or 84 so whatever that i wrote in blue those are the buttons on your calculator so step one what you need to do is go to stat and then go to edit and what you need to do is you're going to be entering all those data points all right and step two we're going to find this button called a stat plot how do i get there is you hit second button and then just click on y equals and step three turn on this thing called the plot one and after that you're going to hit enter and you're going to turn that on and it will show you a few graphing pictures. So this is supposed to be like the y-axis, x-axis, and then there should be a bunch of dots. But anyway, so that's the graph of the first one on the list. And step four, adjust the window, which meaning that if you can't see all the data points, you need to adjust your x-min and an x-max and y-min and y-max under the button called window. And then step five, finally, how are we going to graph the, uh, the linear regression line is you're going to have to go to stat, then hit calc, then you're going to be hitting four, and then you hit enter. And to graph the line, you just hit y equals mx plus b, and then hit graph. You're like, what in the world? So don't worry, I will make a separate video and then attach it with this lecture video. Okay, so let's go through uh, part A, graph the data in scatter plot. So basically what we need to do is we have to plot points where here's our all the x values and then this is our corresponding y values. So first one we're going to be plotting to 20, 35 and the second plotting point should be 420, 50 and so forth. Okay, so this is completely off scale, but let's just go with this. So first ordered pair is 220 comma 35. So we're going to be plotting here. Next one is 420 comma 50. So that's about here. Next one is 480 comma 60. So let me just put it like right here. And then next one's 560 and then 70. Let's pretend this is 70 and 590 and 105 and then when 680 it's gonna go to oh did i miss something here i think i missed 610 okay so when it's 610 it's 65 so it's gonna bring it kind of down here and then what's the next one there uh 6 80 comma wait what is it? 680 comma 80 so here's a maybe like right here and then 720 comma 90 so let's just put it like around here okay so i know that this is completely drawn off to scale so my apologies but on the next slide we will actually graph this on your uh on our graphing calculator since we're kind of running out of room, uh, let me do part B on the next page. All right, so part B says use the data points 480,60 and 720,90 to write a linear function that defines the amount of cholesterol C of X as a linear function of the number of calories X. So now let me just copy and paste the scatter plot that we just did. So here it is. Now, what we want is a linear function that connects those two dots. I, I changed the color into pink, uh, which is 480, 60, and 720, 90. And we want to call this function as c of x. So this is y equals c of x. So let's do it. So first thing, what do we need? Slope. So let's first compute the slope of that line so let's go with y2 minus y1 all over x2 minus x1 so again it doesn't really matter which one you want to call x1 y1 so let's uh, let's just all do this together so let's pretend this is your x1 y1 and this is your x2 y2 
Okay, so now let's plug those values in. So here you're going to get 90 and minus 60. Whole thing divided by 720 and then minus 480. So that's going to give us 30 over 240. Uh, we can simplify that, right? That's 1 over 8. All right, so let me box that because this is uh, important information that we need to know. Now, from here, what we can do is uh, we can bust out the point slope form and then make that into a slope intercept form. So just in case you forgot what the point slope is, it looks like y minus y1 equals m and then x minus x1. Now, as long as you got the point slope form, you can simply solve for y and that equation becomes the slope intercept form. But anyways, so let's do it. So it doesn't matter which ordered pair that you want to take. So how about this? Let's take 480 comma 60 as our point. All right. So here then let's just follow this through. So here you're going to have a y minus y1 is 60 equals m, which is 1 over 8. And then here you're going to have x minus 480. All right. Now let's keep simplifying this. Then here you're going to have y minus 60. So now I'm going to distribute 1 over 8 to both terms. Then what do we get? 1 over 8x. And then what is that? Minus 60. All right. And then adding 60 to both sides to solve for y then we're going to get y equals 1 over 8 times x. So now we are going to call this y equals a function of x. So let's call this c of x. So therefore, our c of x is going to be 1 over 8 times x. Now let's look at part c. It says, interpret the meaning of the slope in the context of this problem. Now remember that our x value determines the number of calories. Now instead of x and a y axis, we're going to have a c axis because we just defined a function c of x, right? So what does c stands for? c stands for the number of cholesterol. And from part b, we determine that the slope of this line is 1 over 8. And the question C is asking, what does this slope represent in this particular problem? Now, let's recall the average rate of change formula. Do you all remember that? Isn't it nothing but the slope of a graphed function, right? So 1 over 8 is exactly the same thing as the rate of change. Now, since our y value, sorry, I, I'm calling it a c, but notice that the what does the y value represent? They're, they uh, represent the number of cholesterol, correct? So slope of 1 over 8 means that the amount of cholesterol increases, because it's simply increasing, slope is positive, at an average rate of 1 over 8 milligrams per calorie of hamburger. So what's 1 over 8 milligrams in decimal is 0.125. Does that make sense? So let me just write that out in sentence and then maybe we'll understand that. So let me just write down the answer here. So M equals 1 over 8 means that the amount of cholesterol increases at an average rate uh, of 1 over 8, which is 0 0.125 milligrams per calorie of hamburger. Hopefully that made sense, but let's just move on to part D. It says, use the model in part B 
to predict the amount of cholesterol for a hamburger with 687 calories. So think about it. What is the question asking us to compute? Now, did you, do we not come up with the cholesterol function of x, which was c of x? So here, what they want you to do is this. Remember, c stands for the cholesterol. x stands for the number of calories. So here, if I, let me just write down the, the model that we got, which is the equation c of x equals to 1 over x. And C stands for the cholesterol, X denotes the number of calories, then this problem is basically asking you to compute C of 687. So let's do that. So that same thing as 1 over 8 times, what is that, 687? So if you multiply that out, uh, you're probably definitely going to decimal value. So let me just approximate that as. 85.875 milligram and that is a lot of cholesterol on the next page i provided you uh, how to graph the linear regression line or the line of best fit by using ti83 or ti84 so again um, please let me know if you have any questions all right so here is how to do the line of best fit. So first, you gotta turn this darn thing on. So how do you turn it on? It's right here, it says on. Now, next step, what you wanna do is you wanna click on stat, it's right here. And then first, it's already highlighted under edit. So here you just hit enter. And then I already put the data points in here. So here, these are all the X values, which is the hamburger calories. And list two will be the cholesterol. So how do you enter those is this. So just look at the, uh, the chart. So first it's 220. And then you just hit enter. And then you put 420. Hit enter. 460. Enter and so forth. Now if you want to go towards the Y values, which is under L2, all you got to do is hit this right scroll button. And then you basically do the same thing. You just go 35. Enter. You got the idea, right? All right. So now what we need to do next, after you're done inputting all that, you need to go to stat plot. So that's right here, right above y equals. I don't know if you can see it. So what we need to do is you have to hit the second button and then y equals. All right. Now, how do I know that the plot one, two, three, four is which one works is whatever that's highlighted. That, is, that means that that part is on. So right now I have a under... Uh, what is it number one so I'm just gonna hit enter and then on plot one make sure that you highlight it under on and then for the type you're gonna be picking the first picture so the, I don't know if you can see that can you see that one so the first one is that data point so I'm gonna highlight on that one and then what we need to do next is we have to adjust the window so here go to window it's right here oh i already put the values in there but let me just clear it so now if you look at the x values right what's the smallest value hamburger calories smallest hamburger calories is 220 so just so you know just to be on the safe side and i want to look at all the data points in one graph i'm just gonna put 200 and then here what is the biggest x value which is what's the highest hamburger calories? That's 720. So just be on the safe side. I'm just going to put 750. And make sure that the X scale is 1. And now Y minimum. Let me just erase that. So Y minimum. So you're looking at the cholesterol. So what's the smallest? 35, right? So just to be on the safe side, I'm just going to put 30. So that way I can look at the whole data points. And the Y max. Uh, what's the highest cholesterol that's 90 so that's the reason why i have it under 100 okay so now after that you're gonna have to go back to stat so again it's this button here now you want to scroll to calc and you're gonna go to number four do you see this is linear regression x plus b so hit enter and then hit enter again whoa look at that 
So here is the line of best fit equation. Here you have y equals ax plus b, but that's supposed to be mx plus b, same thing. So our a or m is 0.118198-ish. And then our y-intercept is going to be 4.97117, yada, yada, yada. All right. So now let me just um, hit the graph so that way you can see where the data points are. So hit graph. So those are our data points. Now, write down what the value of A's and um, B's were, right? So I think it was approximately 0.1139 for the slope, and then 7. Point, what was that? I can't see. 7.48ish, 483ish for the y-intercept. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to y equals. Now we're going to hit 0 0.1139. Just approximation and then X so do you see this variable button X so if you hit that it will automatically give you X as long as you're under the function mode and then plus 7.483 so you're gonna 7.483 all right and then you hit graph oh look at that beauty so that is the line of best fit. So I hope this helps a little bit. Let me know if you have any questions. All right, I'm officially going to stop here for this section. I know that was such a long section and we learned so many different things. So make sure to write some good notes. And if you have any questions at all, you know where to find me. Great job, everyone, and uh, I guess I will be talking to you uh, on the next section. All right, take care.